Peugeot's classy medium range model has sharpened up its act. This second generation 508 aims to offer a fresh approach to D-segment motoring and does, offering an appealing combination of style and savoir faire. Life's too short for boring car design, Minnell. Big French cars used to be interesting, distinctive. Now they are again, or at least this one is anyway, the second generation version of Peugeot's 508. It competes in the medium range Mondeo sector, but it delivers something quite different, offering a choice of five door fastback and SW estate body styles. You might even prefer it to something with a premium badge. Once upon a time, European roads were filled with volume brand D-segment cars. Mondeos were plentiful, as were the mainstream mid-sized Vauxhalls, Renaults, Citroëns and Peugeots that competed with that Ford. But that was then. A new model from this class is quite rare to see these days, partly because so many brands no longer bother to sell them, which is, to some extent, uh, rather short-sighted, given that the huge Chinese market, which is unafflicted by badge snobbery and an insistence for impractical SUVs simply loves cars of this kind. Hence the reason why Peugeot has developed this second generation 508, despite the fact that it'll probably be as rare a sight as a unicorn on British highways. Indeed, for likely buyers, that'll be all part of the appeal. This Gallic maker used to have a distinguished and rather stylish history in selling larger D-segment designs of this kind, with the 403 model of the 50s, the 404 of the 60s, the 504 of the 70s and the 505 of the 80s. With the switch to front-wheel drive that accompanied the launch of the 405 in 87, though, the company rather lost its way and successive models, the 406 of 95, the 407 of 2003 and the first generation 508 of 2010, well, they were somewhat forgettable. So for this new era 508, launched in early 2018, the brand had a complete rethink. Out went the boring three-box saloon body style, replaced by this stylish five-door fastback coupe design, which sells alongside a sleeker SW Estate model. Also ditched was the upfront discounting policy for fleet buyers that led to the plummeting residuals that this model line has suffered in the past. Today, companies will find it harder to slash the price of the 508 than a BMW 3 Series or an Audi A4. And as a result, the depreciation rates of this Peugeot are better than both those cars. Yes, really. Uh, the interior quality and technology is up to premium snuff too. It's certainly a cut above Mondeo's and Insignia's as Peugeot seeks to position itself as what it calls a high-end generalist automotive brand. Plus, you get class-leading running cost efficiency, a gorgeously appointed cabin, and a driving experience that the French maker reckons will make you really want this car. As a result, uh, the company reckons that this 508 changes everything. Well, we wouldn't go that far, but it's certainly true that it might change the way that you think about Peugeot. And here, we're going to find out why. Peugeot CEO Jean-Philippe Imperato says if you drive this car, you'll buy it. Well, that's quite a claim, particularly given that the brand has never made a really fine handling larger model. Back in the 70s and 80s, that didn't matter much because in compensation, big Peugeots cosseted you with a particularly comfortable ride. And once that particular element of driving dynamics had been abandoned, well, there really wasn't much reason for anyone minded to enjoy themselves behind the wheel to choose one of the Gallic Maker's D-segment models. But the design approach certainly looks promising here. The low set eye cockpit driving position and the wrist flick response of this little wheel give a cart like feel. It makes you want to explore the handling balance, which, in our view, in this class, you'd have to be in a BMW to better. Being front driven, there's only so far that the French engineers could go with this 508 in that regard, but they've clearly spent a long time tuning the multi link rear suspension for the ideal balance between supple damping and sharp cornering response, and it's definitely paid off. The caveat here is that you uh, need to be in a car fitted with adaptive damping to get the full effect. And on the diesel models, that's a feature that's either optional or can't be had at all.
That variable damping system is standard on all the petrol versions though and it works as you'd expect via the provided settings of the driving mode system that you access by prodding this little switch down here by the gear lever. Now there are normal, comfort, eco, sport or manual modes uh, and as usual with such setups uh, these settings also influence steering feedback, the throttle response and the gear shift timings too. And in this case, uh, the most focused sport setting delivers a throatier feel to the engine note, uh, which is nice in the petrol models. It's not so good though with the rather gravelly timbered diesels. Having mentioned engines, uh, let's talk you through what's on offer with this second generation 508 Peugeot introduced unit that we haven't previously seen, the 1.6 litre PureTech power plant that we're trying here. Uh, in this 180 horsepower state of tune, it manages rest to 62 in 7.9 seconds on the way to 143 miles an hour. Uh, the top 225 horsepower version uh, improves that to 7.3 seconds and 155 miles an hour. Your diesel options start with a 1.5 litre Blue HDI unit. That's a variant that'll probably be passed over by most people though, despite its impressive regality. That's partly because it's 130 horsepower output, it's somewhat less than the class norm. Although 62 miles an hour in around 10 seconds en route to 129 MPH still sounds pretty reasonable to us. But it's partly because it uh, can't be had with the imported adaptive suspension package that we referenced earlier. Now this base diesel is the only unit in the range that can be had with manual transmission, but typical 508 buyers almost certainly won't want that either. To be fair, they're right. The smooth EAT 8 eight-speed automatic gearbox suits this car so much better, and it hunts more decisively amongst its various ratios when it's paired with the extra torque of one of the two-litre Blue HDI diesels. The 160 horsepower unit puts out 400 newton meters of pulling power, and that's enough to tug along a 1.8-ton trailer. And that's a stat that'll be of most interest to the potential buyers of the SW Estate body style. It won't feel especially eager if you're tearing away from the traffic lights, but the stats say that 62 miles an hour from rest occupies 8.4 seconds on the way to 134 miles an hour, and those are figures that change very little if you go for that unit in its uprated 180 horsepower form. Now, if none of those options appeal, then the other possibility open to 508 buyers is to opt for the part electrification that you can ask your dealer about. In the previous generation range, that was delivered by a non-plug-in diesel hybrid powertrain. Uh, this time around, though, the current zeitgeist dictates that this Peugeot should be a petrol hybrid with full plug-in capability, so that's what we've got. Now this setup is uh, based around combining the 180 horsepower PureTech engine that we're trying here with a 110 horsepower electric motor powered by a 300 volt lithium ion battery pack which can be recharged in less than two hours from a 6.6 kilowatt 32 amp wall box. Once it has been, uh, a 508 in this form can travel for up to 30 miles without using any fuel at all. Or you'll have the e-save function to store your accumulated battery charge for later in the journey. Whatever 508 you choose, you should find it to be a car that you bond with quite quickly. That focused eye cockpit driving position is one reason for this, but another is the fact that uh, intentionally this Peugeot isn't quite as wide as some of the cars in the class. So when you're sat within the lane of a typical British A or B road, you feel there's a touch more space to breathe. Now cruising refinement is also impressive and that's helped by the sleek aerodynamics and also by the installation of thicker premium style glazing. Uh, now we referenced the carefully configured suspension setup earlier that does occasionally get just a little bit caught out by lower speed potholes and speed humps but the well controlled cornering demeanour at speed more than makes up for that. Through some of those turns, you might feel that the steering, although it is pleasingly precise and direct, uh, could offer a little extra feedback. Another slight potential frustration as well lies in the way that the gear shift paddles are fixed to the steering column, which means that they aren't always there when you want them to be, when you're trying to do uh, an upshift in the middle of a corner, for example. Otherwise though, there's much to like here and there's quite a lot more cabin tech than comparably priced segment rivals can provide. 
the absence of conventional speedo and rev counter dials, for example, uh, you get virtual gauges instead on this configurable 12.3 inch uh, instrument binnacle screen. And if you think that's a gimmick, well, you certainly won't like the iCockpit Amplify system, which is fitted to the GT series models, which offers a one touch change to the things that you see, sense, and feel in the cabin. Two settings, relax and boost, can be preset with different lighting intensities, uh, seat massage options, screen colors, sounds, and your choice of either normal or sport driving modes. From one perspective, all of that is a bit silly, but then if we're absolutely honest, a lot of the things that we really like in life are a bit like that when all said and done. And that includes the continuing preference amongst customers in this class for wanting a family five door that's shaped rather like a coupe. Now this 508 pulls that off with rather endearing elan. It might not be for you, but it's a more credible large Peugeot than any other we can remember. If you see somebody driving one, well, credit them with a bit of discernment. Being different can sometimes, after all, be better, as this car proves. This second generation 508 opens up a fresh chapter in Peugeot design, and it's one that prioritizes style over space. Now to create this rather distinctive look, this car is eight centimeters shorter and it's six, six centimeters lower than its predecessor, plus it's also narrower at the rear than at the front. Otherwise, the big news is that the saloon body style of previous Peugeot medium range models has been abandoned in favor of a hatch body shape, although the brand wants us to call that a fastback. The idea obviously is to position this car as an alternative to stylized D-segment premium models like the Audi A4 Sportback or the BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe, which might be something of a stretch, even though, like those cars, this one does have a set of trendy frameless windows. If the 508 formula appeals, you don't have to have this body shape. Uh, there's an alternative SW Estate version, which looks equally avant-garde. Either way, there's a clear desire here from the designers to do something different, which we really like. As advertised, the roofline really is quite coupe-like. It's low and sleek, and it barely reaches 1.4 meters in height, and it flows into intricately fashioned rear wings that require a complex metal curvature stamping process that's normally only used on exotic sports cars. Uh, that's one of the things that's made possible of these super thin premium style shut lines. Further forward, the key upper crease line separates beneath the door mirror, this pronounced one defining the waistline and a gentler angled sweep flowing back beneath the door handles. Uh, giving the flanks further shape is this lower crease line just above the door sills and that separates arches that house large wheels that can be anything between 17 and 19 inches in size. That depends on trim. We've got the 19 inch Augusta diamond cut two-tone rims fitted here. It may be, though, that it's the sharky looks of this front end that'll really sell this car to you, in which case you might want to be aware that two of the things that most notably characterize this aren't available with the two cheaper trim levels. And that's why you'll probably want to stretch at least to this GT line spec, which delivers the two features in question. Uh, now, those are this chrome-plated checkerboard style grille and these really distinctive uh, slim LED tusks that flow from the headlights down into the spoiler. Uh, this horizontal bonnet has been lowered as far as the designer's dared and in a nod to the brand's classic 504 model of the 70s, it bears a model designation for the first time since that period. We also like the rear treatment with its elegantly raked back tailgate and its rear lights that sit behind stylized glass panels. Uh, the ultimate visual effect possible here is also trim specific. Only the top models get full LED 3D rear illumination with a pronounced claw effect signature that springs into life as part of a welcome sequence when you unlock the car. Uh, the lamps feature adaptive intensity. They differ in appearance depending on your pavement perspective. And as usual with modern Peugeot designs, they're separated by a glossy black horizontal strip. Of course, as ever, what's more important though is the stuff that you can't see. In this case, a sophisticated EMP2 platform, which has enabled this second generation 508 model to shed 70 kilos of weight. 
As for the uh, inside, well, it'd be disappointing if the extrovert exterior styling wasn't mirrored by equally interesting treatment of the cabin. And that's just what you get. Here again, you get a very different design to the kind of thing that you'd normally expect to find in this segment. With a quality of fit and finish which justifies Peugeot's premium pretensions. Uh, the main thing that you'll initially notice though is the so-called eye cockpit ergonomic layout. That's Peugeot's term for interior design which positions you so that you're looking at the instruments over the top of the steering wheel uh, rather than uh, viewing them through it. Now this wheel is small and it's low set. It facilitates a wrist flick quality of steering feel, which uh, Peugeot reckons its owners really like. It features flattened top and bottom sections so that when you adjust the thing, it's uh, really easy to find a position that doesn't either uh, brush your knees or obscure those gauges up ahead. Now a few writers still complain that they can't see the digital dials unless they position this wheel lower than feels natural, but um, no one of our testers have experienced that problem. Now word about those instrument gauges, they represent another of this cabin's defining talking points. Conventional dials have been completely replaced by this fully configurable and customizable 12.3 inch color screen. Five different display modes, personal, minimum, dials, driving and navigation are all accessed via a roller switch on the left hand side of the steering wheel and they prompt intricately animated changes from the state of the art animation and they give visual priority to speed readouts, navigation mapping or driving safety features. Or you can choose to view only the absolute minimum of information if all that stuff gives you a headache. Uh, with the personal option, you can decide what the two main virtual dials will show. Uh, driving aids, engine info, uh, g-force meter, temperature, media, navigation or trip computer info. Just about everything else you'll need to know can be found on what looks like a tablet PC attached to the fascia, a multifunction color touchscreen that grows from 8 to 10 inches in size beyond entry-level trim. Now this works well, although it is sometimes a little slow to respond to requests. It can, like the instrument layout, a display in your choice of two colors, either blue or copper, as it deals with the usual stereo, phone, navigational and informational functions. It also has a mirror screen feature that via the Mirror Link or Apple CarPlay systems allows the monitor to show certain apps from compatible smartphones. Now we were less pleased to find that this screen's also burdened with the ventilation controls. In our view, key things like that are much better separated out. Still, on the plus side, the menus on this display are easier to access than they are in some other PSA Group models because uh, these beautifully crafted piano-style keys just below the monitor offer instant shortcut options to the monitor's most commonly used functions. Now one of these shortcut options is a feature you'll either love to death or think to be something of a gimmick, the iCockpit Amplify system which is standard on GT line and top GT models. It claims to be able to offer a one touch change to the things you see, sense, smell and feel in your travelling environment. All this via two settings, relax or boost if you're feeling a bit more dynamic. Now these two modes can be configured with different cabin lighting intensities, normal or sport driving settings settings and differences to the screen colors and the sounds of the little musical jingles that you get with various functions. If your 508 has the optional driver seat massaging feature which is standard on the top GT variant then the four settings that come with that can also be programmed into the Amplify setup. Overall, we rather like the Amplify package, but there's not much point in having frippery functionality like that if basics like cabin storage haven't been properly dealt with. Before fussing about with abstract ambiances, we'd prefer Peugeot's designs to find a way of engineering right-hand drive models so the majority of space in the glove box wasn't taken up with the fuse box, which has once again happened here. To be fair, that is compensated for by a lot of storage space elsewhere. Uh, there's 32 litres of cabin storage in total, and quite a lot of that is in this big stowage box between the seats which has this neat stitched butterfly opening double lid and it incorporates uh, an aux in point. In front of this lies a twin cup holder area which ought to have a lidded top but compensates with the cool blue lower illumination. 
There's a lidded storage area incorporating a 12 volt port to the left of the electronic gear lever. Plus there's a hidden illuminated storage area behind the center stack, uh, which is ideal for charging your phone. Uh, to this end, this area features twin USBs and an optional wireless phone charging mat. Uh, the door bins are also reasonably sized and they include recesses for bottles. And on plush models, they come carpeted to stop loose items from rattling around. A look up and you'll look in vain for a sunglasses compartment, but there are ticket clips just behind the sun visors here. What else? Well, we started off praising this cabin's premium feel, but there is a slight caveat to that. Base trim levels lack quite a few of the things that make you want to forget about this car's lack of premium pedigree. Stuff like proper leather upholstery with double stitch detailing, contrast fascia and door card stitching, blue ambient lighting, aluminium pedals, stainless steel door sill scuff plates, a frameless rear view mirror and a perforated leather steering wheel. Stretch at least to this GT line spec and you'll get all of this. All models though do feature these excellent wraparound seats that have received the seal of approval from the German AGR, that's the Action for Healthy Backs organisation. As for all round visibility from the uh, low set driving position, well that's okay from the front, but your view rearwards is somewhat restricted by the swept back styling, so you'll be glad of the fact that the reversing sensors are standard and you get a rear view camera fitted beyond entry level trim. <coughs> So, time to take a look at what's served up in the rear. Now, there are lots of ways in which this car uh, positions itself midway between volume Mondeo-like models in this sector and premium Audi A4 Mercedes C-Class style contenders. And here's another, body length. Now, a Mondeo or a Vauxhall Insignia Grand Sport measures in at just under 4.9 metres. With an Audi A4 or a C-Class, it's around 4.7 metres. This 508 measures in at 4.75 metres. So, we weren't expecting it to be a segment leader in terms of back seat space but let's see you pull open this long door and as usual with the fast back style designs you try to avoid spearing yourself in the stomach with this acutely angled trailing edge of the frameless rear window Once inside, it's actually reasonably spacious. Now, we mentioned earlier on that the body length this time around is eight centimeters shorter. Cleverly though, most of that reduction has come from things like shortening the front and rear overhangs. So the wheelbase of this second generation design is actually only 2.4 centimeters shorter than before. Now that means that the relatively few people who bought that old 508 model won't notice too much difference when they're sat in the back of this one. Uh, not in terms of leg space anyway, which as we just predicted is better than a premium brand D-segment model. Uh, there's three centimetres more legroom here than you get in a comparable Audi A5 Sportback for example and that's despite the fact that the Ingolstadt model has exactly the same body length. Um, that Audi offers five centimetres less elbow room too. Of course all of this is relative. Uh, you get considerably more space from something more mundane in this segment like a Mondeo or a Skoda Superb. They will notice plenty in terms of improved cabin ambiance though, especially in a plushly specified model like this one. Uh, the intricate stitching on the seats and the door cards, the carbon fiber trim, and little touches like these illuminated central USB ports all deliver an elegant feel. Uh, despite the swept back roof line, headspace won't be at too much of a premium unless you're of basketball playing stature. Uh, the relative narrowness of the cabin won't help if you have to take three folk back here, but the low, uh, transmission tunnel makes dealing with that eventuality easier than it would be in some rivals. If there are any two of you, uh, you can use this center armrest. That's only standard above entry level trim. And there are two cup holders provided here. Uh, there are also netted seat back pockets and decently sized door bins. So let's finish with a look out back at boot space. Now this powered tailgate, which works with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper, is optional on most models, annoying me so because this huge hatch is rather heavy. Uh, once it raises, a 487 litre space is revealed. That's actually 14 litres more than was provided by the longer previous generation model. Uh, the huge aperture and the pleasingly low loading height puts us in mind of a Saab 900 model from the 90s, although there's not 
quite as much room as you used to get in one of those. Um, if you were to be loading carry-on cases into here, then seven would fit. Uh, to give you some class perspective on that, 10 would fit into a rival Volkswagen Artian or Skoda Superb. Peugeot has remembered to include a 12 volt socket on the left here and a bag hook on the right. Uh, there's no more space beneath the floor, but that's because a space saver spare wheel has been provided. So we're not going to complain about that. Um, if you've avoided entry level trim, a ski hatch is provided, but Peugeot hasn't thought to equip the rear backrest with a 40-20-40 split. Uh, pull these toggles behind the headrest to push everything forward. Do that and you'll find that the seats don't fold quite flat, but a very reasonable 1,537 litres of space is opened up. Of course, if you're going to be doing that very often, then you ought really to have opted instead for the SW Estate body style. Now that delivers a 530 litre boot, that's thanks to the extra length of the load area, and a magic flat button, which uh, when that's prodded, folds everything down to reveal a 1,780 litre space. If you didn't already know that Peugeot was positioning itself in the D segment midway between the volume makers and the premium brands with this car, you might readily guess the fact from just a glance at the 508 price list. Mondeos and Insignias can be had from around £20,000, BMW 3 Series and Audi A4 models tend to sell from around 30000 And this 508, well, yeah, you've guessed it, prices start from about £25,000. Uh, that's for this five-door hatchback body style that Peugeot wants wants us to call a fastback coupe. The alternative SW Estate, uh, that's likely to account for around 60% of the model mix, uh, commands a £1,600 premium over its showroom stablemate. So let's take a look at the range spread across four main trim levels, Active, Allure, this GT line variant and Top GT. At the foot of the lineup, Active spec has to be had with a 1.5 litre Blue HDI 130 diesel engine, the only one on the lineup that can be had with manual transmission. Even here though, the vast majority of customers uh, will probably pay the £1,600 premium for the smooth EAT8 eight-speed auto box, which is mandatory elsewhere in the lineup. Move up a rung in the range to a Allure spec and you'll be offered a much wider choice of engines, uh, taking a 1.5 litre Blue HDI 130 E88 Allure fastback variant costing around £28,000 as your starting point, just under £1,500 more gets you either a 2 litre Blue HDI 160 diesel or a 1.6 litre PureTech 180 petrol unit. Peugeot, though, rather confidently reckons that most 508s will be bought kitted out with the top two trim levels, which means that likely buyers will be paying in the 32 to £39,000 bracket, and that's well into premium territory. Uh, the GT line spec we've opted for here will be most people's choice. It's available with the same three units offered to Allure buyers. Uh, we've chosen the petrol PureTech 180 version. For the really premium engines, you have to stretch the top GT trim, which gets you the choice of of either a 225 horsepower version of the PureTech petrol power plant or a 180 horsepower version of the two litre Blue HDI diesel. And the value proposition. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this car's positioning itself a little apart from other volume brands in the D segment, which is why a mid-range 1.5 litre diesel 508 will cost about 10% more than an equivalent Volkswagen Passat, about 15% more than an equivalent Ford Mondeo, and around 20% more than an equivalent Vauxhall Insignia. If, as Peugeot hopes you will be, you're minded to compare this car to premium branded rivals, then the engine that you're most likely to be looking at is the 2-litre Blue HDI 160 diesel unit. Uh, with Allure trim, one of those will save you around £2,000 on a comparable Jaguar XZ, around £3,000 on a competing Audi A4, and about £5,000 on an equivalent Mercedes C-Class. Peugeot, though, argues that more direct comparisons would be made with the two five-door premium models that share their five-door fastback styling with this 508, the BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe, and the rival that was this French contender's benchmark throughout development, the Audi A5 Sportback. We'll use today's 508 PureTech 180 GT line petrol model as a point of comparison here. Its price tag, which was around £31,500 at launch, would leave it around 
£3,500 shy of a comparable Audi A5 Sportback 40 TFSI Sport 190 PS S Tronic and around £5,000 below the price of an equivalent BMW 4 Series Grand Coupe 420i Sport Auto, which hopefully clues you in a bit to the way that this car has been price pitched in its market. Now, you might be uh, interested to know that Peugeot isn't the only volume brand pitching a five-door fastback coupe-style D-segment model at the premium makers. Uh, two other cars have already blazed this trail in recent times, Volkswagen's Artian and the Kia Stinger. Now, we went into this test assuming that this pair might provide this model's closest competition, but it isn't quite that simple. Uh, the Volkswagen is a slightly larger car than a 508, and equivalent volume variants of that can cost up to £5,000 more. The Kia is even more difficult to match with powerful engines that are only matched in output by this Peugeot in its priciest trim level. To match the Kia's pricing with a 508, uh, you'd have to be looking at the GT line trim that we're trying here and the petrol or diesel units in this Peugeot with a bit less power than would be offered by the equivalent Stinger. Uh, in compensation though, uh, you would of course enjoy considerably lower running costs. OK, enough with the comparisons. Ultimately, we don't think you'll fully buy into this 508 until you've tried it and recognise that it does indeed live up to its maker's premium aspirations. If once you've done that, uh, you find yourself to be something of a Peugeot convert, then the deal could be sealed by a perusal of a standard spec because it is reasonably generous. And I mentioned earlier, the trim range kicks off with active spec, and even this includes 17-inch alloy wheels, automatic headlamps with LED daytime illumination, rear parking sensors, and special magic wash windscreen wipers, which automatically activate when it rains, and place their washer nozzles on the blades for quicker and more effective cleaning. Uh, now, you also get an alarm and a space over spare wheel, plus there's a drive mode system, which alters steering feel and throttle response, and and on an E88 auto model, gear shift timings too. Uh, move inside and you'll find an iCockpit instrument binnacle which is based around a 12.3 inch configurable digital instrument panel. Plus there's a dual zone climate control and there's also an electrochrome rear view mirror. Infotainment is primarily dealt with by an 8-inch colour touchscreen in the centre of the dash, uh, which offers connected 3D navigation, voice control and an 8-speaker DAB stereo system, as well as Bluetooth and a mirror screen media connectivity function. Now this allows you to duplicate your phone handset's display onto the centre dash monitor, and the setup supports the Mirrorlink system for Android devices and Apple CarPlay for iPhones. The next trim level up, Allure spec, adds a bit of polish, courtesy of things like diamond cut styling for the wheel trims, chrome tipped exhausts, and inside ambient lighting and part faux leather upholstery. Uh, from this point in the range, the center dash infotainment screen grows in size to 10 inches, and Allure variants also get keyless entry, a reversing camera, uh, power folding mirrors, front parking sensors, two more USB ports, uh, seats with heating and lumbar adjustment, and a rear armrest with ski flap. Uh, petrol powered models also get active suspension that works through the settings of the drive mode system. If you want a sportier and more technical take on 508 motoring, then the next trim spec up, GT Line, provides it. And that's what we've got here. Uh, the look at this level is subtly different thanks to the addition of a smarter, checkered style grille and slender, tusk like LED light strips that incorporate indicators and which flow into full LED self leveling headlights. Uh, there's also black trimming for the door mirrors, the side windows, and the rear diffuser, and larger 18 inch two tone diamond and cut wheels. Inside, a package of little upgrades uh, make the cabin ambiance at this level a lot nicer. Uh, things like proper leather upholstery with double stitch detailing, contrast fascia and door card stitching, uh, blue ambient lighting, aluminium pedals, stainless steel door sill scuff plates, a frameless rear view mirror, a perforated leather steering wheel and flock line door pockets. Uh, GT line bars also get rear privacy glass, plus there's a wireless smartphone charger 
charging plate. Uh, perhaps our favourite feature though at this level is iCockpit Amplify and that's a system offering two configurable interior options called Boost and Relax. At the touch of a button these two settings change the cabin atmosphere via ambient lighting and musical settings. Quite a lot of kit then, but there's still space on the spec sheet for the top of the line GT variant to add even more. Uh, the wheel arches tightly house larger 19 inch Augusta style alloy rims with a two tone diamond cut finish. Plus, you get a smart electric tailgate which opens when you're off the foot under the back bumper. Inside, there's an active 12 channel 515 watt focal premium hi fi system, and there's classier cabin finishing with lovely double stitched upholstery in real Nappa leather. At the front, the seats are eight-way electrically adjustable with a memory function and they feature a massaging function which can be activated by the uh, settings of the iCockpit Amplify system. Uh, the active suspension system, which is only fitted with certain engines further down the range, is standard at this level and you also get a package of extra camera-driven safety features and we'll cover those off in a moment. Uh, on to extras and options. Now many of the features that we've referenced on the plusher models can be ordered as individual options further down the range. Uh, let's pick out a few key things. If, as many buyers will be, you're choosing the 2.0-litre Blue HDI 160 diesel engine with Allure or GT line spec, bear in mind that it's unfortunately necessary to pay extra for active suspension. And we would recommend that you do because the setup works really well and it probably completes the functionality of that driving mode system. Uh, avoid entry level trim and you can also specify the thumping focal premium hi-fi setup that we've been trying here. If budget limits you to an Allure model, you can create a GT line spec feel by optioning in full LED headlights, the checkered style front grille, rear privacy glass, uh, real leather upholstery, a smartphone charging plate and the iCockpit amplifier system with its configurable interior ambiances. Across the range, you can add in a panoramic opening glass roof and of course a tow bar. Uh, here we've been trying the optional night vision system that helps you to detect living beings in front of the vehicle at night time or in low visibility conditions using an infrared camera which works across a range of up to 250 meters and which projects images into the digital instrument binnacle display. And most 508 buyers will need to pay extra for things like a powered tailgate and a 360 degree camera system with or without fully automated parking assistance. Now, on to aesthetics. Unless you want your 508 painted in solid hurricane grey, you'll need to be paying your Peugeot dealer extra for your choice of shade. Uh, there are various metallic options, plus two special finishes, ultimate red or the pearlescent white finish that we have here. Uh, the Heron diamond cut two-tone 18-inch wheels we've got on this GT line variant can be added in further down the range. Um, with this GT line version, we might be tempted to add in the top 19-inch Augusta style wheel rims, also maybe massaging front seats or softer Nappa leather upholstery. And on a top GT variant, there's the extra cost option of having the Nappa upholstery in red. On to safety, as you expect, uh, there are all the usual things, twin front side and curtain airbags, although there's no driver's knee bag, uh, Isofix child seat fastenings, tyre under inflation detection and an active bonnet that would uh, minimise injuries in a collision with a pedestrian. Uh, plus there's the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction and stability control. And across the range, uh, you also get Peugeot's Connect SOS and Assistance Package, which will automatically alert the emergency services with your exact location if the airbags go off. Uh, in addition, you'll be wanting to know about the cutting edge electronic radar driven stuff and there's plenty of that. As you'd expect, all versions of this Peugeot get autonomous braking. Now this is the brand's AEBS, Automatic Emergency Braking System, and that detects hazards ahead and will apply the brakes if the driver doesn't react. Um, there's also a distance alert system which will tell you if you're getting too close to the vehicle in front. And there's also active lane keeping assistance with road edge detection and that's a package uh, that will detect if you stray over the centre delineating lines on the highway or over the road edge line and it'll add subtle steering assistance to guide you back to where you ought to be. 
Avoid entry-level trim and you'll get four further camera-driven features, active blind spot detection, which will alert you if on the move you're just about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle, advanced driver attention alert, which monitors your reactions for drowsiness, uh, traffic sign recognition, then that pictures speed limit signs that you pass and then displays them for you on the dash, and smart beam assistance will automatically dip your headlights for you at night. Now, if you want to go further than that, you'll need one of the optional drive assist packs. Uh, now these are standard on the top GT which include ACC adaptive cruise control. Uh, with the EAT8 automatic transmission this includes lane positioning assist and a stop and go function which uh, recognizes an oncoming tailback and can if necessary slow you right down to a stop and then seamlessly start you off again. Now there's not much point discussing fuel or CO2 figures or engine efficiency until we've addressed the elephant in the room here, which is residual values. Now we've referred to this issue throughout this film, but it's particularly relevant to do so here. Uh, no matter how much you might like the styling or the uh, distinctively French demeanor of a 508, you're not going to buy one or more likely lease one if depreciation is as catastrophic as it was on the previous model. So here's a stat for you to chew over. 41%. That's the percentage of original value that industry experts reckon will apply to this Mark II Model 508 after you've had one for uh, three years and 30,000 miles. Uh, those are the same people who think a competing BMW 3 Series or Audi A4 will be worth just 38% of their starting price after the same period. So how has Peugeot managed to turn this around? Well, the fact that this car is found in relatively tiny numbers in our market obviously helps, but the main change relates to the fact that the company no longer has to aggressively sell you this car. These days, virtually uh, all Peugeot's profits come either from SUVs or commercial vehicles, so there's no need for the brand to look for large production numbers elsewhere in its model lineup. If you want a 508, great. If you don't, then the company is not going to incentivize you into buying one with drastic residual wrecking discounts in the way that it would have done with its previous D-segment models. Now with that out of the way, you might be more interested to hear about this car's class leading efficiency showing. Now this starts as usual with modern PSA group products with class leading lightness, a 70 kilo weight reduction in this generation guys. And that's delivered primarily through use of the conglomerate's impressive EMP2 platform. Uh, the 1.6 litre PureTech petrol 508 we're trying here weighs in at just 1420 kilos. Rival Audi A4 and A5 models can get somewhere close to that showing, but most other rival D-segment models are vastly heavier. A uh, comparable petrol automatic Ford Mondeo, for example, carries around nearly 200 kilos of extra weight. And that kind of bulk has got to hurt you with the pumps, and so it proves this 508 PureTech 180 EAT8 model will go around 13 miles further on every gallon than an equivalent Mondeo 1.5 litre EcoBoost Auto, and it puts out a massive 42 grams per kilometre less CO2. To be specific about this Peugeot's figures, you're talking 51.4 mpg on the combined cycle and 125 grams per kilometre of CO2. Even in its top 225 horsepower state of tune, this power plant still manages 49.6 mpg and 131 grams per kilometre. So, do you still want that diesel? If you do, though, you might be equally impressed by the readings delivered by the various Blue HDI black pump fuel units. Well, the entry level one anyway. Find us another car in this class that can deliver 74.3 mpg on the combined cycle and 101 grams per kilometre of CO2. Those are the figures that you'll get from the base 1.5 litre 130 horsepower unit when it's paired with E88 automatic transmission. They are fractionally worse with a manual box. Uh, the news isn't quite so good, though, if, as is likely you're drawn towards the brand's older tech 2 litre diesel, uh, probably the Blue HDI 160 power plant. Uh, this records 62.8 mpg and 118 grams per kilometre. That's a little down on the figures that you get from a comparable Audi or BMW, but it's still well ahead of uh, equivalent Vauxhalls and Fords. For some reason, the 180 horsepower version of that unit does a fraction better. It manages 64.2 mpg and 114 grams per kilometre. 
Peugeot has also developed a plug-in petrol electric power plant for 508 buyers and that will be able, so the brand claims, to allow this car to travel up to 30 miles between charges and put out just 49 grams per kilometre of CO2. That's based around mating the 180 horsepower PureTech petrol engine that we're trying here with a 110 horsepower electric motor powered by a lithium ion battery pack. Uh, that variant can be recharged in less than two hours from a 6.6 kilowatt 32 amp war box and it features an e-save function which allows the driver to reserve electrical energy for planned routes ahead, say for the town driving that you might want to do at the end of a long motorway journey. Whatever 508 engine you choose to drive with, uh, planning ahead is certainly going to pay frugality dividends. Of course, running costs uh, about a great deal more than just fuel economy and CO2 readings. So uh, what else are you going to need to know? Well, there's the usual unremarkable three-year 60,000 mile warranty and service intervals for all engines are every 20,000 miles once a year, whichever comes first. You can budget ahead for this work by taking up Peugeot's service plan, uh, which for a fixed monthly fee can cover you for up to 50,000 miles of motoring over either three or five years. Everything we've told you here will help Peugeot dealers when it comes to offering competitive leasing rates on this car and if that's what you're after then it's likely you'll be offered two basic options. Uh, now the first of these is a straightforward deal where you pay a deposit and a monthly sum as you would with any other leasing contract or you could alternatively choose the French brand's popular Just Add Fuel package. Now that wraps up insurance, servicing and tax into regular payments so all that you have to do is to fill up the tank. And having mentioned insurance, we should uh, finish by guiding you through the groupings. This 1.6 litre PureTech 180 petrol model sits in groups 28E or 30E, depending on the variant you're looking at. For the 225 horsepower version of this engine, it'll be group 34E. As for the 1.5 litre Blue HDI diesel, well that's group 22E or 24E. If you prefer the larger 2 litre Blue HDI diesel unit with 160 horsepower, your premium is going to be based on a 29E or 31E ranking, and that depends on the trim level you've chosen again. Uh, the Pokia 180 HP GT variant, that's rated at group 32E. We usually finish with a conclusion, but this time we'll do so with a question. Why on earth is this car still called 508? Peugeot has set out here to distance this contender from almost every preconception you could have applied to its dull, forgettable predecessor, and has done so in everything but model name. There are, of course, bigger and more prestigiously badged D-segment models you, you could choose over this one. A couple might also be a bit more fun to drive. But as a piece of pavement theatre, this Peugeot stands apart from most of its rivals. Now the brand insists it isn't going to incentivize upfront asking prices, so the few who do take the plunge and enter the brave new world of 508 ownership won't dismay their company accountants with plummeting residuals when the time comes to sell. Quite the opposite, in fact. Another balance sheet incentive lies with this model's class-leading fuel and CO2 efficiency stats. Are there issues? Well, you have to avoid the more affordable trim levels to get the full 508 design experience, and that means you really will be paying premium brand money for one of these, uh, which means that you've really got to want one. But you might. The avant-garde cabin, the lovely focused driving position, and the distinctively French quality feel are all things that will endear the right kind of buyer to this car. Someone bored with Teutonic excellence and car park cred, who comes to this segment in search of something deliciously different. And in summary, well, not everyone will like a 508 and even fewer will be minded to buy one. But if it had more generic appeal, it wouldn't be the distinctive contender it is. This car makes its segment a more interesting place, just as big Peugeots once did. There's a sense of inherent desirability here that you just can't get from most of the other contenders in the class. If you like, it's the want one factor. And here, you might find that a very strong draw.